Okay, everybody, thanks a lot for joining us on KMOX. Charlie Brennan on The Voice of St. Louis. Well, I want to ask you, everybody, about uh, three women who were convicted of murder. They were all sentenced to life in prison for killing their husbands or having their husbands killed. There were allegations that the women had been beaten by their husbands. If you're beaten by your husband, does that give you license to kill him? Hello, Jan, you're on KMOX. Hi, I'm just calling to say that I, I don't feel that domestic violence is a reason to kill your spouse. You know, I don't think you should stick around. Don, take it away. What's the difference between you walking down the street and being mugged and you killed him? versus a woman was beaten by her by her husband. It's not as if they were in a fight and in self-defense, she got the kitchen butcher knife and killed the guy. I don't think the women should go to jail. It's Nobody knows how it is. They hired hit men and they had their husband off, mafia style. Why didn't they just leave as opposed to murdering them? Um, hi. I have been beaten by my husband, and it's not that easy to just get out. It is not easy. And what prevents you from getting the heck out of there? I love him. Nine one one. My neighbors just come in here and say she saw her husband. By accident or purpose or what? I don't know, sir. I, I know that he does beat on her. Okay, stay on the line with me, okay? He won't get you going there, honey. Don't let him get her. Okay, stay on the line with me, okay? Okay, honey. Okay, honey. Okay, honey. Take a deep breath, honey. I'm not, I'm not hearing me. I'm your friend. Listen closely. He's on the other phone, okay? He's talking to us right now. You don't know where you're at. No, you don't. No, you don't. Did he beat you up? No, not today. Why did you shoot him with a gun? I don't know. He said he was going to kill you. No, I didn't know he was going to I've been locked up 23 years. I'll be locked up 24 February 2002. And do you know when you're eligible for parole? Uh, 2028. 20, okay, and how old will you be then? About 97, 98. About six months after we got married, that's when the abuse started. And uh, if I didn't do everything Melvin said, he used to kick me all the time in my ribs and in my back, make me steal, prostitute. I didn't know what to do anymore. He'd jerk me on bed and pull me across the floor. And he, I just couldn't even, he chained me right almost to the bathroom and he drove off and just left me chained up. was a period of time in Missouri law when abuse victims could not enter evidence of abuse in trials. And so their sentences were made without knowledge of the judge or the jury that they had been abused persons. And that created these incredibly harsh sentences that no longer even exist. In 1987, Missouri was the first state to pass a state law that established the battered spouse syndrome. It was a new opportunity for women to at least get information before the court on the level of abuse that they had suffered. All of that information was previously not allowed at trial. They were told by their attorneys not to bring up the abuse that they had suffered because that would be seen as motive. The biggest example of how the law has misunderstood intimacy is in this area. 
and there are people who have truly paid the biggest price for something that the law doesn't really have an understanding of, women who kill their batterers. Anyone else like a Pop-Tart? Breakfast of champions. When I was in law school, I was approached by my professor, Mary Beck, about doing a clemency petition on behalf of a victim of domestic violence who killed their abuser. And Mary Beck just took us out to the prison to meet her. I think that when you work with somebody in prison, when you're just kind of starting out, it kind of changes your perception and your perspective. It made me realize that more could be done for other women. Nobody needs you like somebody in jail. And unfortunately, the person who needs you the most is usually the person who can afford to pay you the least. So that's why I do it. In 98, the Missouri Coalition Against Domestic Violence contacted all four law schools and asked us if we would band together. And we reviewed a number of cases and selected initially 12 women. Ultimately, the group of us called ourselves the Missouri Battered Women's Clemency Coalition and opted to go forward with 11 of the 12 petitions. What we decided was we would represent women who were convicted of murder, who were involved in their crime. We looked specifically for women who had a documented history of domestic violence that should have been or could have been presented at the, to the trial court and was not. Hi, my name is Esther Skaggs. And I'm here on voluntary manslaughter with a 15-year sentence. Ruby Jamison. And how long have you been incarcerated altogether? 13 and a half years. My name is Roberta Carlene Borden. I received life without possibility of parole for 50 years. He grabbed me by the hair and just started beating my head on the headboard, pushing me back down on the bed, and that's when he tied me up. He said, if you ever hurt me, you better kill me because I'm coming. And I was like, oh my God, I've heard him. I've heard him. What do I do? Like both my eyes and bloody my nose. How often did this abuse occur from you? About every other day. He ripped my uniform top off me, and I mean, it was like a madman in that car. Is there anything else that you would like to tell the governor? This is your chance to get it on tape. Well, I certainly hope that he would um, take me into consideration to go out on clemency. I don't think I would have that much trouble in the transition part because I don't drink, I don't use drugs. I can make it. In 2004, Governor Bob Holden granted clemency to two of the women in the clemency group. And in an only in Missouri scenario, the Missouri Board of Probation and Parole didn't release the women. And the Supreme Court of Missouri said, you have to release her because she's been granted clemency. So in May 2007, two years after the granting of clemency, Shirley Lute left prison. Shirley Lute served 29 years in prison after a jury convicted her of hiring her son to kill her abusive husband. The courts freed loot, saying she had battered wives syndrome, something the courts did not recognize in the late 70s. I've been praying for years for God to bring her home. He does really answer prayers. It just took him 29 years to do that, so. And this kind of says that we haven't forgot about those women, that, you know, we can go back and, and correct their sentences and do justice by them still. Lou told me she has plenty of catching up to do. Oh, yeah, BLTs and steak and all of that. And you're going to get a lot of that now. Well, I got to watch my figure, you know. <laughs> Lou told me it's wonderful to be free.
This is Toby, my biggest bear. It's one I've had for a long, long time. And this is Francis. This is Muskins. Of course, he's going to make a sound. I have never been around stuffed animals that made noise. And I, uh, you know, sing songs and all that. I had never seen that before. They fascinate me. It's something I've never seen before. It's a well-lived-in place with all these dolls and everything, but I kind of like them. Shirley was a good candidate for clemency because of how excessive her sentence was. She was the longest serving woman in Missouri. She was sentenced before there was any recognition of battered women's syndrome or the effects of domestic violence generally. From the age of four, her father sold her for wine. And she went from finally escaping when she was a teenager and married someone who then ended up beating her. And her son killed him and she was convicted of being an accomplice to the murder of Melvin Lute. She's still negotiating being in the world. Initially, all she wanted to do was sort of stay in her room, and she asked permission to leave the room. She did things that were consistent with somebody who's been institutionalized. Where'd you meet me at? I met her at Oak Towers. I was lost my wife two and a half years ago. And I run on to her Oak Towers, and I've been going with her ever since. He's my fiance. <laughs> yeah, that's what mm. he is. He's my sweetheart. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I tried to leave Mel. I had everything packed up, ready to go, kids and all. And Melvin come home and caught me. He said, you ain't going anywhere. And he took me and he locked me in the basement and he left me there for five days. No food, no water, no way out. He said, you're not going anywhere. I was the one that was being tortured. You know, why should I have to go to prison for being tortured by somebody? You know, but I missed my whole life, you might as well say. Those people who have life without parole have to be given clemency by a governor. In other words, their sentence has to be commuted to something that will allow them to see the parole board or will allow them to be released. We didn't have as much success as we wanted, and so since that time, we also worked through the legislature to just give them the chance to put their case before the parole board. Governor Matt Blunt signed a law providing the opportunity for parole for battered women convicted of murder. The 2007 law allows parole for people sentenced to life in prison if they had been victims of abuse. The coalition helped draft the legislation. The reality is that this law only applies to four women because the coalition set up to address 11 cases and most of those women have been paroled or have served their complete sentence. So there's only four left. We all received hearings on the same day, and uh, we all went one after the other, and I focused on the domestic violence because I wanted to make sure that they heard it from her perspective, not just read it, but heard it. The hearing was probably 20 minutes, and then we waited for six months. The board has denied parole to three women who claim they were driven to murder their husbands by lives filled with domestic abuse. An attorney for two of the women says the board's latest decision will be appealed. It was one line that would not be in society's best interest to release the inmate at this time. Nothing.
Carly. Hey, Carly. How are you? Fine, how are you? What's going on? I hear you got a new dog. I got a new dog this today, and I'm going to do the basic training on her for her to be adopted to make a better pet. It helps me a lot through the day here, because some days, you know, you have bad days, and just walk in the room, and the little tail's going, and jump up on you, happy to see you, and that makes everything better. I would be 82 years old before I would go see the pro board. And I came in when I was 33 years old, I came in. My grandparents raised me. I didn't live with my mom because she just couldn't afford to keep me up there. So one weekend, I was talking to her, and my uncle had just become a minister. And uh, I got on my knees, and I told her, if you take me to hear my uncle, I will start calling you mother. I met my husband many years ago when he was young. We was raised up together. So I was 14 years old when I got married. I was still a child. I was married about two years before the abuse started. Then it was just mental. I was fat, I was ugly. You're a whore like your mother. And I guess at first I thought maybe that's the way marriage is supposed to be. I would come home from work and uh, he'd be waiting for me. And I'd fix him something to eat. Well, it wasn't good enough. And he'd hit me and throw that on the floor. Our daughter, she had major back surgery. And she was in a body cast. Well, she didn't get up off the divan fast enough for him. He whipped her with the belt. Life there just was not good. It was like being in prison. We did our best to protect each other, because we knew that if one of us didn't cover our backs, we paid for it. I can't even explain how down he had me. I didn't even know who I was. I wanted to show you the letter that your great-grandson wrote to me. It says, Dear Guy Who Sets Women Free. Hi, I'm Lance Smith, and I'm Carlene's great-grandson, and she's been in there long enough. She has been in there my mom whole life and my whole life. She needs to see more of the outside world. She needs to get out to, so she can live the rest of her life with her family. She hardly knows. Sincerely, Lance. He drives these officers crazy. <laughs> <laughs> How many grandkids do you have now? I've got seven grandkids and nine great-grandkids. I've raised them in the visiting area. Staying in there. I'm trying. Some days it's awfully hard. You kind of go into law school thinking that the system basically works. It doesn't work every time, but ultimately you end up getting good decisions from our legal system. And then you see just complete miscarriages of justice in these situations, and it makes you realize that there are a lot of improvements to be made. When you kill somebody, you have to pay a price. On the other hand, the sentences these people got were way disproportionate to their um, culpability. The board did not correctly follow the statute, and so we filed a writ against them to force them to give them new hearings and hopefully come to what we believe is the right decision, which is that they've served enough time and they're no danger to society. I think they're at a place now where it's like, OK, we gave you your hearings, and now Almost like, now, ladies, you need to be put in your place. I really do. They've obviously shown that they don't want to follow the statute at this point. Right. So they're going to need some guidance from the court on what exactly they need to do. That's right. The one thing about coming back 30 years later is that the guy is not there to present his side of the story. Is it possible that the women change their story? Because if you can claim abuse, 
years later, that's one way to beat your charge right. of being sentenced to life without parole. You know, when you're dealing with a case that's 30 years old, where evidence wasn't developed because it wasn't admissible, in many of these cases, there aren't any records of it because these women aren't permitted to get medical treatment. Carlene's mother saw bruises on her all the time. But because her husband was a police officer, he wouldn't let her complain to the police because those were his colleagues. So there were no police records. And the prosecutor's office in Springfield seemed to believe that that meant there had never been any abuse. This was in a period of time where battered woman syndrome had just been passed. And I don't think lawyers really knew what to do with it because they were afraid that jurors would not understand it and would blame the victim. My attorney, you know, we discussed the abuse and everything. And so right before we went to trial, he came to me and he said, well, Ruby, so far, they don't have a motive for why he was killed. And I think it's best that we not talk about the abuse. And when I said, the, the abuse is what led up to this. And he kept yelling at me, saying, I said, I don't want you talking about it. And I mean, don't talk about it. Both of these women at the time said that I was never abused by my husband. So 30 years ago, they were given the opportunity to present evidence of abuse, but uh, they denied that they were abused. Absolutely. If you're going to claim battered spouse syndrome, you have to admit you did the killing. And so it's a pretty big risk because you're relying on the jury to give you an out. But because it wasn't in the heat of battle, some jurors aren't going to do it. I want to go back out there and be somebody, be the person that I was, you know, before all this happened. Because this, this just isn't a life in here. He tied me up when I couldn't go to work for months, and he hit me in the head with a baseball bat one time. And you try to see past little things, you know, like the screaming. Even when you get slapped, you just think that's not that bad. I think that a real man should never put his hands on a woman. Real men don't do that. But to grow up seeing totally the opposite, me, I've always been uh, a fighter. So I always did fight back. Seeing her being left face down in the snow with fractured ribs, back then, the police came and they left because y'all married and that's in y'all household and that's where we're going to lead it at. I know it's wrong that a person lost their life, but at the same token, when do the cycle ever stop? How old was he the one you saw him the last time? 16. So you're still seeing that 16-year-old boy? Yeah. When you talk to him on the phone? 16 is a baby, Of so. course, yeah. You know, mama's baby. I guess if I had to just really thought everything through, you know, and took my son away from the house, it wouldn't happen. Anybody can make the wrong decision in a split second. But when you get bashed upside your head and knocked down and beat with, you know, wooden coat hangers and stuff, you don't think, you can't think I guess what I should have did was pack my bags and leave. But sometimes you just feel like you're tired of running. 
The first question that most people want to ask is, why didn't she leave? And that's the wrong question. We want to know what's wrong with her when the question is, why is he still beating her? You think she's a lousy wife. You don't like her cooking. You think she doesn't do a good job around the house. You don't like the work that she does for pay. Why, in God's name, don't you leave? And we, we don't ask that question. We turn it all around to, well, why doesn't she do something? The person who is being threatened, the person who has been told, I'll make sure you don't leave, we put the entire burden on her instead of the one who's committing the crime. You're so down, you don't think you can do without him. Finally, you do get used to it, because you think, well, if he didn't hit you, I guess, you know, you didn't do something right. Because it's to the point, you know, you just, you just live for it, I guess. When the woman kills, when the woman doesn't leave, there's outrage to that. And it's because we don't understand domestic violence. Murder is never acceptable. So no matter what the abuse was, from the point of view of the batterer's family, it could never justify a killing. They're not in it. They don't understand the trapped nature. They don't understand that it escalates when the woman tries to leave. And so they're just left with Yes, he hurt her, but she could have left. Cole County Judge Richard Callahan said the parole board must reconsider its earlier denial in the cases of Arlene Borden and Ruby Jamison. That order stemmed from a law passed two years ago that said parole hearings must consider the claims of battered wives. They look at your history of criminal involvement. Mm -hmm. You have none. Mm -hmm. Abuse of drugs or alcohol? No. Mm -hmm. Need for institutional substance abuse or a sex offender program? No, doesn't apply to you. And then lack of a good faith effort toward getting your GED? Well, you came in here with a degree. Mm -hmm. And then the judge says, the board shall not consider the seriousness of the offense. <laughs> oh. That's what makes this new hearing pretty different, because in the past, what were all the questions they asked us about? The seriousness, the seriousness of the offense. I mean, that was like oh, wow. all they focused on. And so it says now you have to use this standard, which is whether or not there is a strong and reasonable probability that, that you will or will not thereafter violate the law. If you want to know how I'm going to do on the outside, look at how I've done in here. You know, that message is going to take us somewhere. Amy Lorenz Moser is attorney for Vicki Williams and Carlene Borden. She joins us right now on KMOX. Now, uh, you, you insist that these women were beaten, although some of their relatives disagree. And don't you agree if you kill someone, you should pay a very harsh consequence? Let's go back to Miss Borden's case. Her husband was a police officer. She attempted to leave her husband on multiple occasions. He hired a private investigator, threatened her children until she came back. So in other words, if you think the police won't listen to you, take the matters into your own hands? That's not true. I don't think that what these women were convicted of doing is a correct course of action. However, each of them has been in jail for over 32 years each. They did not receive a slap on the wrist for this. Carlene, unlike a lot of these women in these cases, is actually somebody who tried to leave. She ended up living with a boyfriend. Yeah, I think it was first part of February when Don found us. On February 27th, that night, I fixed dinner, and we watched Family Feud. I got up and went to the bathroom. And when I came back, there was Don in front of Delbert with the gun. Me and my brother heard a loud crash, like something had fell. Gilbert, he looked at me and he says, uh, Carlene called the ambulance because Don just shot me. I couldn't breathe. Mom was just, you could talk to her, but I don't really think she knew what was, 
what was going on. And he told me the kids would do everything that they, he said. Because there was somebody, there was shotguns on us at the, in the window. Well, Don, he made a deal with the prosecutor. He put everything over on me so he could get less charge. After that, then I was guilty. My trial lasted for two and a half days. The jurors didn't want to stay in the motel because it was Labor Day weekend. So they sentenced me life to 50 there on Friday night. Carlene didn't have enough money to hire her own counsel, so the court appointed attorneys to represent her. The court appointed her husband's attorney to represent her in the murder trial of her husband. That's a conflict of interest. There's no way around it. He says, you know, I can understand why Dilbert didn't want to divorce you, because you're so pretty. And he just went on and on. And I thought, what kind of lawyer do I have? Nobody in my family has ever been in trouble. So we didn't know what to do. So I lost that appeal after that. My hope would be that she gets out that she gets to return to her family, to her two children who want to be with her very badly. That this next round of legal action will be able to achieve what we haven't yet. Three Missouri women serving time for murdering their husbands will not be let out on parole, even though they claim they were abused by their spouses and that led to the killings. The Missouri Board of Parole denied parole for Carlene Borden and Ruby Jamerson. The three won't be eligible for another hearing for three years unless this ruling's overturned. Oh, boy. Yeah. So you got this on Friday? Yeah. OK. And it's my understanding that the decisions that they gave are similar for Carlene, too. Did you see hers? Exactly. Exact same so they're exactly the same. Because it's a farce, and they're not following the law. And they did exactly what they did last year. I know what I mean. I mean, here we go again. Same thing, over and over and over. I tell you, I just. <sighs> I don't know what you can say. Right. I don't know what you can say. Yeah. still fighting another year. I never thought it would have been 10 years, you know, and you still, you know, the same people still working with you and fighting for you, and I want to live. To think back 10, 12 years ago, I don't really remember saying that, but I made it my mind that I still have a fight left in me. I feel like there is a light at the end of the tunnel. All these years, I have kept myself busy. I'm in a dog program. I train dogs for disability. Every day, you know, I try not to think about all of it all the time. It's like my son said, Mom, do you think we're ever going to have, we're ever going to be free from, I have to live this over and over again? I said, son, I hope so. I think the parole board is looking for the perfect victim, and I think the problem is that they will never find it. A lot of these women suffer from the fact that they don't fit our image of domestic violence. That image is of women who are submissive at all times, 
often white. If they don't fit that image, if they've ever fought back, a lot of folks stop believing that they're victims. When women kill, they often are the first person to call the police, and they are really remorseful, and they take on more responsibility than even reflects in the facts. All of that then becomes usable evidence, both for the decision about charging, but then later at trial. We're not allowed by law to see any of the information that they have. The institutional parole officer writes a report and then makes a recommendation to the board. We're not allowed to see that. It's just unlike anything I've ever experienced as a lawyer. You just feel completely in the dark. We're not exactly sure what we're going to do yet. We need to review the judge's order, and then we need to decide how to best proceed. Bothering you. We turn him on every morning so we can hear him bark. I have about four people that is the closest thing to my heart because they're my penitentiary family. They're making them uh, pay to wash their clothes. 50 cents a load to wash them and 50 cents to dry them. How can they make it on $8.50 a month? And if you think that they give you shoes, you're wrong. You have to put sanitary napkins in the bottom of your shoes. And if they find out what you did, then you get a violation for using sanitary napkins other than what you use them for. Good morning, my dear. Good morning. What do you think you're doing? Going to have breakfast with my special guy. You feed me too good. After she got out of prison, she would come over and tuck me into bed. And I, I told her, I said, okay, this has got to stop. I can't have you tucking me into bed anymore. You know, it's kind of weird. <laughs> but she's making up for lost time. So now we just getting to know each other. Again, Krenda's ways and Cody's ways and Roy, I don't really know Roy anymore. It's like meeting a stranger again. But we're doing better, you know. Those cases that predate better women's syndrome are the easiest to make an argument for clemency. Battered women's syndrome is a, I think a lot of people think it is the panacea. The fact of the matter is, battered women's syndrome doesn't help very much. It's a theory of learned helplessness. If you shoot someone, you're not helpless. And so the learned helplessness only helps you understand why she didn't leave before. It doesn't help you understand what happened at the time of the killing. My name is Tanya Mitchell, and I'm um, cut. I don't know how old I am. 911. My neighbor's just come in here screaming, help me, and she thinks she shot her husband. By accident or purpose or what? I don't know, sir. Hey, sir. He won't get you go in there, honey. Now, Tanya, uh, no. why did you shoot him with a gun? I don't know. He said he was going to kill me. He said he was going to kill you. No, I no, he was going to kill me. Okay, here's Tanya's room. I pretty well decorated it with stuff from... Yard sales, garage sales, everything's ready for her. There's even clothes in her drawers. We'll probably have to wash because they've been in there since I've moved out here. And <laughs> this is her room.
Jimmy was only like 5'9", but when you would meet him and have any type of interaction with him, you would think he was like six foot something and huge, just his persona that he had. He did all kinds of little things for me that just was really impressive, and he was romantic and very intelligent. You know, one time we was out at a rest area on a run, and he picked the big roses right in the middle, bring them over, hand them to me. Gestures like that was just, I thought, was just awesome. But as time progressed, our relationship just got worse and worse. He was involved in a motorcycle club. She became the property of that motorcycle club. Couldn't walk, been beat with a bat, bruises on my forehead from playing Russian roulette. Taking the gun and jabbing my forehead with it, putting a bullet in, spinning it, pulling the trigger. Grabbed a pair of pliers, had the pliers around my toe, trying to pull my toes and toenails off. He pretty much told me that we were gonna get married at gunpoint. I was ready to get out of the relationship, but he wasn't gonna let me go at this point. He said if um, he couldn't have me, nobody could have me, and he meant it. And we flew to Vegas. He took me through the Mojave Desert, Was told me the whole time how he could kill me and just leave me in the desert. It was um, real hard to take, you know, thinking here I am, this man who I love my whole life, just thought the world of, and the abuse just kept getting more severe and worse, and I'm stuck. The abuse escalated to sort of monstrous proportions. It's a hard case to even talk about. It's more of a case of domestic terrorism. They would go on, on these motorcycle runs, and he would allow her to be gang raped by members of the motorcycle gang, you know, telling her that she enjoyed it. He would beat her because she allowed it to happen, even though she had no choice. Her family encouraged her to leave the situation. I think everyone was stumped about how to do it. He called my wife and kids by name and told me my address and, and told me, he said, you either tell me where she's at or I'm gonna go kill him. In practical terms, when you're talking about poor people, you know, the sort of, I'm gonna escape to California and everyone I know better escape as well, just was not practical, I don't believe. In Tanya Mitchell's case in particular, there were very graphic photographs that were taken by coworkers, coworkers that were concerned that ultimately she would be killed and there'd be no evidence that it was her husband who had killed her. They took her to a building, took pictures of bruises all over her body and stored those photographs. For the last 10 months before the shooting, he would tell me every day how he, it was my lucky day and he was gonna let me live. And the day of the shooting, he come into the bedroom and got me and wanted some breakfast uh, and I didn't have none ready. He said it was my lucky day and that his big decision was how he was going to um, kill me. And from that point on, fear was just instilled in me in um, I snapped sometime that evening. 
you have to prove there was an immediate threat or physical injury that you would have to kill or you'd be killed. And a lot of times, that's not how these things happen. These sorts of questions about when she can pull the trigger and when she can't, I think that's sort of silly. I think she was going to die that day. The reason she didn't die that day is because she pulled the trigger. If you can prove self-defense, you can be found not guilty. But if you prove battered woman syndrome and don't prove self-defense, you're guilty of all charges. This was always one of my favorite school pictures of her. Reddish brown hair, her little plaid dress. <laughs> Tanya turned what? Two. Two. We've done the pro board twice. Once with Washington U and then Cher in 208. For 2010, we're not going to go through all the trouble with a brief and doing petitions and letters because they're not reading it. If they would have read the 208 one, there's no way that they would have came up with an answer that she may go out and do the same crime again. What if we do like we did before and we send, uh, get those addresses for up at Jeff City and we just start emailing constantly? I'm telling you, I have no faith in the parole board. This is my answer to the, uh, my last parole board hearing. This does not appear to be a reasonable probability at this time that the offender, that'd be me, would live and remain at liberty without again violating the law based on circumstances surrounding the present offense. So they think I'm going to go out and do this again or something. I don't know. We filed another writ against the parole board, and that's basically a lawsuit that says, you've exceeded your authority. You don't have the authority to do this. And you need to take that decision and throw it out. So Amy, are you getting ready to uh, practice your argument? I am. There are several points of error that we said that the parole board made. This statute specifically set forth a requirement that they provide a report detailing the reasons that they were denying parole or granting parole. They literally provided two sentences of decision for each of these women after over a year of consideration of their cases overall. At this point, I really don't have much of a feel for where she's going. You know, both sides made good arguments, so we'll just see what she decides. One of the things that really frustrated me about the hearing was that the board didn't necessarily believe they had been abused. What he specifically said was, the evidence was thin. Yeah. Thin evidence, domestic violence is very difficult. And, you know, there have been a lot of cases where you wished you had evidence this good. <laughs> we filed our new writ. Mm -hmm. This is a new judge. She doesn't know anything about our case. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's real familiar with the statute. It's very new. It only applies right. to, you know, a small group of women. <laughs> exactly. So, so I don't know. I don't have a lot of answers today. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's okay. You're here on your birthday. That's so, right. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's important. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good thing. In prison on birthday. <laughs> No place I'd rather be. That's what I told you. All right. Yeah, I'm... I've talked to your children, and they are going to be there at the parole hearing, which is wonderful. Actually, I think last time what was hardest for you was talking about the abuse to your children. Right. That's more than anything is the abuse that he done with the kids. Because, you know, I can take a lot, but when you mess with those babies. When I was 14, my father molested me. I just kind of just put way back, and hopefully it never would have to surface. When I told my mom about what had happened to me, she didn't say anything. 
And then she just cried. Told me she was sorry. This last time, I fell all the way down. You know, with Teresa, it just missed, it tore me up, you know. I was so hurt. I wanted to give up, but I couldn't. Because I've got my family out there. I will be seeing you on the 27th okay. at 8 o'clock, and we'll you know, plan and be ready, okay? Okay. Hang in. I will. I'm first. I'm going to. I'm going to. I just feel like, as I said, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We got more, another light just, you know, open, shown for us. And to me, I feel like it's even brighter this time. So, you, you can't beat yourself down, you know, because, you know, at first you feel like, oh, I failed again. But I don't feel that way this time. Today, three Missouri women convicted of murdering their husbands decades ago have been granted parole. Williams and Borden will be released from prison October 15th. Ruby Jamerson will be released later in 2013. They are the only remaining inmates eligible for parole under the 2007 statute. They were all sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, <laughs> but apparently not. And so she laid the paper down there, and I mean, it was like I jumped about the feet. I'm not going home for two more years, but it is a date, and I'm happy about that. We had a good day in here Monday. There was tears flowing like crazy, and Carmaine's going to be two days short of 32 years. She was just in shock. When they said released, I kind of think I zoned her out for a minute. And then when she told me a third time that, yes, she was released, then I hung up and I just started bawling. I couldn't believe this. It was good news. Best day of my life. See the trash truck? No, what's that? The trash truck was brought in specifically to keep you from filming. Get this over the top. Okay. And how do you want your eggs done? Over easy. Okay. Bacon or sausage? Bacon. Mm. Bacon. White yeah. toast, wheat toast. Wheat. Okay. <laughs> now you're going to remember. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. I guess I can't play. Okay. Wow. How'd that go? Push it. No, just push that down. Oh, this is going so much fun. Look <laughs> at okay, the things you can learn. I know. It takes five minutes. Oh, oh, no, it just busy. takes forever to get on the internet. Oh, oh that's real pancake. Yeah. She is ridiculous. Nothing like prison pancakes. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> we'll have to see that place again. No, no way. 
I'm just thinking it feels good riding in a car without no handcuffs on. My gosh. Or the shackles hanging between my legs. The parole board absolutely believes that these women are learning life skills in prison. I don't know if, you know, when they go home at night, they still believe that, but I believe that a lot of them needed a lot of help, that they needed counseling, that they needed resources, that they needed a hundred things, but they didn't need prison, not, not a single one of them. Would you ever want to be in a relationship again? At this point, no. It's not worth the risk, the hurt, the pain. It's still too fresh, and I'm still in love with Jimmy. And do you miss him? Yeah. How much do you think about him? I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I've been holding my breath for a long time. <laughs> Missing a whole lot. Missing a whole lot. I thought that because he didn't have a family life like I had, that if if I could just love him enough that he would be good all the time. And if I had to die, then I had to die. He would beat me up with a screwdriver, handle on my head, put a big knot up there, his fist, black both my eyes. Then when he would get done, he would run a bath and light candles and sit in there and wash me off. Put the potatoes over my eyes to open them up because they're swelled shut. People just don't understand the fear that women go through with an abuser. The fear is so real, and you have reason to fear. But for some reason, if it's your husband, they just don't think it's that big a deal. But if it would be a stranger or a serial killer or something, then they would be like, oh, we got to do something about this. I think most people that feel that fear they're not around to tell you about it. They're not, they're dead. When I was developing this book for her last parole hearing and going through boxes and boxes of pictures, this was one that just really kind of got to me. This picture was taken three days after Tanya and Jim got married in Vegas. She comes back for her wedding shower, and she has two black eyes. And in a room full of about 30 women, not one person said a thing to her, including us, while we were playing games and everything that you would do at a bridal shower. It just disgusted me, the fact that that's what everyone's approach was. Instead of someone saying, you know, can you get an annulment? Can you run away? <laughs> you know, everybody just kind of brushed it off like it was nothing. How horrible to have to live a life like that and have everybody around you not say a word about it until it was too late. Prosecutors are in a little bit of a conundrum with this issue. Because on one hand, it's against the law to beat your spouse. It's also against the law to kill your spouse. When it's a victim who has also committed a crime, I don't think that prosecutors always change gears. There at the end of my sentencing, when he said 15 years in the courtroom went crazy, and he said, now you know she's not going to uh, serve that much time, so I would think that should be in the transcripts so we could use his own words against him or whatever. I know, but I can't find the transcripts. Your mom doesn't have them, so I'm trying to figure out how I can get the transcripts. I just need you to focus on yourself, and I need you to focus on us getting through this so that we can get to the parole hearing. We just have to stay positive. OK? All right. Sounds good. I All love you. I love you, too. I'll talk to you soon. OK. Bye-bye. Bye. 
I certainly worry about her. I, I certainly believe that her husband still has friends that are a danger to her. She's starting to get a little nervous about it, and they're still threatening her. So she's kind of freaking out about that. Do you think she you know, should stay in front of the parole board? She's scared for her safety and her family's safety. That's what you're kind of thinking? I mean, I think it's a, a validation of her feelings to say that she's scared. Well, because she is. You know, if they wanted to do anything to us, or if they wanted to do anything to you, they know where all of us are. Right. So, but on I the mean, other hand, the purpose of the parole board and what they're trying to do is see if she has overcome what happened to her. So if she can't answer those questions, then to them, it's always going to look like she's not ready. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out how we can help her get past that and help her get home. I woke up this morning and didn't have a backache for the first time. So it was just like sleeping on water. <laughs> Oh, it feels great to be here on this deck. I've dreamed about this since my son had it built long in the summer. I've been locked up for so long, and I really don't know how I'm going to feel being in a house, in a home, because I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I don't know how I'm going to act. I feel like I really don't belong because I don't know what to do. I want to sit down and just cry because I feel kind of lost. My dad is a prison guard. I know. If any of the prisoners try to escape, he gets to shoot them. Oh, yeah, I know. But we don't want that, though. You can't think that many years being told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. It's going to be a little rough, but you know, she's a strong woman. It won't take her too long. Right here, honey. Yeah. So how was Walmart? Oh, man, it was scary kind of first. <laughs> I'm not used to big old stores like that, you know? Uh, crazy <laughs> going to get lost. Yeah. Well, I was walking pretty fast, kind of like, well, don't, don't let people see me. You know, they think I'm, well, I'm just a regular person. You know. It was hard to leave Ruby, because I've known them for so long, and they, and really, they're my family. But still, it was, it was nice leaving them. And one day, their day will be coming, too, for them to be able to come home. I love you, sissy. Good luck. Oh, I love you guys. Call and thank you for All right. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. I expect it to be, you know, real tense and emotional. I don't expect them to let me out of here before my conditional release date, January 2015. But that doesn't mean I, you know, wouldn't want them to. 
So I feel a lot of anxiety when I'm in there. I, I feel like, um, I feel like an ice cube. I feel like, I feel like there's, I've built this wall up around me and I don't want them to see the pain. You nervous? I'm a little nervous, but it's to be expected. Okay. Good Wish luck. me luck. I love you. I love you too. Bye. Bye bye. to take one person in, so she wants her mama there. <laughs> The prison actually was fearful for Tanya's mom's life and actually escorted her to her car before they would allow the victim's family to leave. Normally, the protection is in place for the victim's family. And in this case, it was put in place because they didn't want anything to happen to Tanya's mom. When it comes time to this, I start getting nervous about her being out. I know there's hard feelings with his close friends and stuff. They lost Jim. You know, if somebody has something against you and is wanting to get back at you, you can, you know, you can be found, but I hope that's not the case. Did she do good? Oh, she ended up breaking down as she came in teary eyed. Yeah. How she, come? she was doing so good. I don't know what happened. When he said, do you have anything else to say, she didn't say the things like what her plans were and that she was going to. Yeah. So she lost all of that when she got upset. She just lost it. He said, is there a reason why you think that you should be let out of here sooner? And she turned around and she told him why she was crying. And she said, sometimes I feel like I shouldn't be let out sooner, you know? You didn't, you didn't do real bad, but you could have done better. You didn't do real bad, you know? I know. I know. Hey, settle yourself down. You did what you could. Well, you know, no matter what, we'll just have to wait and see what's going to happen, okay? Jurors in these cases should be allowed to consider what actually happened in real life. Women like Tanya Mitchell, I, I hope they win. I think it's a very, very tough road. They did a study in the state of Missouri about the disproportionality of the sentences that women who killed their spouses received versus men. There were vastly more men in prison for killing their spouses. None of them had the most severe penalty that you could get. Of the women that were in jail for killing their spouses, there were many that had the most severe sentence that you could get. I think that women who don't have adequate legal representation end up going to jail, and they go to jail a lot longer and a lot quicker than the women who do have good lawyers, and that's just a fact. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Collect call from Tanya. I went back up a few minutes ago and got my answer from the pro board. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. I got a date. You got a date. When? It's January 21st, 2015. Huh? 2015? I know, Mama, but at least it's a date. Ah. Uh. My God, that's four years away yet. Five, almost. It's only like a little over four years, about four years and 10 months. That's your date to get out anyway, right? Right, yeah, that's my conditional release. Oh. They, they me. I just wanted to tell you, she got her answer. And it's not a good one. January 21st, 2015.
What is going on? I don't know. Look at my plate. Oh my God. Better get over here, Norm. Sorry. Nervous. Not bad. It'll be okay. Your long time. Sure has. Got new life, yeah. I know I'm free, but I'm still a little yeah. shy. Of, yeah. Because oh, yeah. I just feel like. They're gonna start gonna come in and get yeah. me, you know. I, you still yeah. have that ingrained. Thanks. It's gonna take me a while. These colors. Yes, yeah, I heard a crow for the first time. Jeez. They said, "Why don't you take your shoes off?" So this morning, I've been running around barefooted all morning <laughs> in the house. <laughs> What's this? Oh, that's for dessert. I'll wait for dessert for that. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the prayers that's answered. Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings and benefits we receive from you from day to day. I pray today, Lord, that you would guide us and direct us. Help us each one, Lord, as we come to you at this time, Lord, that we might offer our praise and thanksgiving unto you, Lord, for the things that you've done for us. Amen. Amen. Since she hasn't been around, it's just Thanksgiving dinner. You just make the dinner and invite the kids over and stuff and clean up and go on. Now that mom's home, it's going to be a big deal. Because she's going to show me how she cooks and how I cook. It's going to be different. The family is whole again. I sure don't look like it did when I owned it. Brand new car back when I had it. Uh, they took care of it for a lot of years. Yeah. I was bought back in 72. Two? Yep, I bought it brand new. I picked it out and, uh, and everything. And I kept this sucker clean. Me and the kids drove this many miles, just me and the kids. That's the only good time it was about it because he had it, was in it, was always fussing and fighting. And if it got a little bit over, he'd gripe at me. Okay, let's. I had enough of that car. We're good? Yeah, I'm good with it. Okay. I do not think about Dilbert at all anymore. He don't own me anymore. So he, he can't control me anymore. You can't really say that you've gotten justice for these women until they walk out. It's important not just to them, but to all of us to, to see them be out of prison. Seeing the photographs, I don't see how anybody can look at that and say no. Hi, Hi. how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Good, good. good to see you. Yeah. Tanya's medical records and work records and... Now, what's in the bottom here? Pictures. I guess you'd say crime scene. Oh, great. You well, know. now we'll, uh, we'll probably retain it through the representation. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. we're done. Hopefully with a terrific result, I'll yeah. you know, meet you for a beer. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Jim just downgraded her all the time, told her she was fat and ugly. and But if you met him, you would have thought, oh, he's not so bad. He's just one of those types that could hide it like a lot of guys can. I make sure she gets a visit once a week, whether it's just Teresa and I, you know, my other daughter or what, but she gets a visit once a week. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me into your home. It was so great to meet oh. you in person. Well, I know you're that welcome. It's <laughs> wonderful to, yeah. to talk to you on Let's the phone. Let's do hugs. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> 
this case has a different kind of chance than I thought because we can prove it. I feel like she deserves somebody to help her. You know, I just, I just missed my family. I'm going to have to get out and go sleep. <laughs> Put on a movie. Just to sit down at a table, you know, and talk and eat and have fun with the kids and, you know. Everybody, my mama on the phone, so. We see you. You got to see the house. It's like a museum up here. You, the oh, house is just different. You have pictures, pictures all around. So you got a lot of people who love you here. Oh, yeah. I miss them all, too. We miss you, too! Love you. Love you. I never know what I really want. I just follow the other person. I want so much that I don't know what I really want. Is that hard to understand? <laughs> that you want so much that you don't really know what you want? Well, that's me. <laughs> I'd like to have a home, it's a trailer home, that's fine. But I want to have it where I can have flowers and I have a little dog. Are you calling me? <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. She thought somebody important was calling her. Yeah, he was real cute, Vaughn. Yeah, he was. He was real cute. It's, it's going to give and take family, but we're it. And we're all going to survive it. Do the best we can. Yeah, we're going to fatten you up, boy. We're going to fatten you up. What? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Free from the past. No more thinking about that stupid past. <laughs> no. I think I'll take my chances walking. Me and Ruby, we sat around the table one day and um, we made up our bucket list. One of the biggest things when you come on and visit is you just get a brief hug. That's like one thing I miss the most is my hugs. Eat meat, bacon, you know, some real bacon. I just, grease, I just want some grease. <laughs> and sleep through 5 a.m. count, because everyone's up every morning at 5 a.m. for count. I have this stretch limousine picking me up. Here's all my little family. Yeah. That's just around, just think it's silly stuff to write. It's not silly at all. Sometimes I think um, that if I forgive myself, that then what I did was okay. You have to learn that forgiveness doesn't mean what I did was okay. I forgive him for what he's done. Now I have to forgive me for what I've done. And that's the next step. I would like to say that in my younger days, I grew up in uh, knowing that the man was the boss and they could do with you as you please. And um, a lot, a lot of this, you know, originates from that too. And you feel differently about that now? Oh yes, definitely. I can take care of Shirley and I can make it, given the opportunity to do it. I'm determined. <laughs>